Welcome to the Talking Palm Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Green. On each episode, I invite a guest to bring in any poem they'd like to talk about for any reason. We'll talk about what excites us, what delights us, maybe what frustrates us, and we'll follow the poem and the conversation wherever they turn. And our guest today will also share a poem of hers. Afterwards, we'll have a little bit of silliness and a game. I'm so honored and happy to have as my guest today, Patricia Spears-Jones. Arkansas born and raised like I am, and now a resident of New York City for more than four decades, she's a poet, educator, cultural activist, and anthologist. She's the author of five full-length collections of poetry, including her most recent, The Beloved Community, out from Copper Canyon in 2023, and she's also the author of five chapbooks. She co-edited 1978's groundbreaking anthology, Ordinary Women, an anthology of poetry by New York City women, and 2009's Think, poems for Aretha Franklin's inauguration day hat. Her poems have appeared in journals and been anthologized many times over, and she's been awarded many honors, including the 2015 Barbara Deming Memorial Fund Award for her memoir in progress and the 2017 Jackson Poetry Prize. And she's currently the New York State Poet. Patricia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, I'm I'm excited. (laughs) It's a semi-bleak day here in Brooklyn, so this is like the most fun we've had in a little while, telling you the weather is like... (laughs) <laughs> Before we get to the poem, I actually wanted to ask you about growing up in Arkansas, because you were born and raised in Forest City, which, just for the sake of listeners, was named after Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was Confederate general and is generally cited as the founder of the KKK. Um, so I'm just curious to hear what it was like growing up there. Oh, well, it's kind of in my poems. I mean, I grew up in the last days of the segregated South. The St. Francis County is an odd county. Well, you know, basically the, you know, the white planter class ran everything and I, but there were some odd things. Like I went to an elementary school that had been started by an Episcopal priest. It was called Father King's School and in later Christ Church School. And it was a mission school. So that was one thing. There were, besides the usual Protestant churches, there were, there was a Catholic church uh, and there was a not a large, but a Jewish mercantile class there, too. The, the local department store was Coins department store. And there were Chinese people there. So it was very mixed. Like I grew up in a place that was not supposed to be mixed, but it was. And I, along with several other of my friends, went to a desegregated high school. So I graduated. I mean, I, I feel like I went through all. I went through a Episcopal mission school a segregated uh, junior high school, Lincoln Junior High, yay, and a desegregated uh, high school, Forest City High School. So I felt like I had like the entire range of the kind of education you would get in the from the 1950s to the end of the 60s. It was not a great place. You know, the can, the Klan was there. There were horrible things that happened. But, you know, my family owned their own home. Uh, my mother was a nurse. Um, my biological father was a local entrepreneur. You know, my family was, we were small because my mother only had me, my brother, and my baby sister, who's now in her 60s. Uh, <laughs> you know, I used to just wander. I mean, I just literally would wander around the neighborhood by myself. And, uh, you know, I knew not to, you know, get into anybody's car and any of those things. And, to, you know, if you saw somebody white doing anything, you ran, um, which was reasonable. But I was a reader. Douglas uh, Mesley once asked, well, what was the library in your house? And I went like, what are you talking about? I grew up poor. So what we read were magazines. So I grew up on Life, Look, Ebony, obviously, and Jet does well, you know, and magazines, and also McCall's and Seventeen, and all these, these magazines that were aimed at women and girls. And then, on the, then when I was about fifteen, I discovered Hit Parader, and Hit Parader was this incredible magazine that published the lyrics of pop songs, and it had all these stories about musicians. And the first time I ever read about John Coltrane was in Hit Parader. So, uh, not yet. It may may have been, but I don't remember reading it. I may be reading about Stevie Wonder and Jet, but not John Coltrane. So also music was huge because the radio played everything. You know, my local station played 
country. It played gospel. It played R and B, right? Every day, basically. Well, gospel was usually on the weekends. And then I discovered FM, and then my life changed completely. You know, so I want those children who like had, went through all of that, and then I, you know, left Forest City, and uh, I knew that I was going to leave my hometown, that I was not going to live there. That there's just no effing way that I was going to do that. Because I knew that if I stayed there, I'd be dead by 30. You know, just from sheer frustration. Did I know that I was a poet? No. Did I know what I was going to do? Not really. But I knew I couldn't do it there. Yeah, you wrote, I, I love this quote from Ordinary Women, about New York City. Oh, well, really, I came here for the music that permeates the streets, lofts, rooms, corridors, elevators of this city. I'm here to move and feel with this music. And that feels like something that would be almost impossible in Forest City. Yeah. Well, there were no elevators. <laughs> That's true. Maybe <laughs> grain elevators? I'm not sure. Cotton, cotton gins, but I don't think cotton gins have elevators. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so I just want to share this. If anyone doubts the strangeness of Forest City, um, when school desegregation was ordered, uh, they eliminated school-sponsored dances and social activities to avoid desegregation, and they didn't have their first integrated prom until 1988. Yeah. Wait, wait. But you know what? The the, the funny thing is, I mean, I went to my fair to you reunion a few years ago, is that actually most of the students got along really well that it was not the students who were having the problems. It was the adults. It was the white adults and some black folks, too, because they didn't want to, you know, even deal with this. I don't blame them. Hyper segregation is is terrible. But the weird thing about the South, I mean, I don't know where it's, where you grew up in, is that all kinds of people can live next door. They may not speak to each other, but they can live next door to each other because it's about who owns the property. Right. So you could be a white person with, you know, fancy out, you know, whatever. And next door will be somebody totally poor or somebody black or somebody you don't know. So that kind of suburban character that is in the rest of America doesn't quite fit in most of small town, you know, at least at least in that part of Arkansas. It just didn't. I mean, the other thing, also the thing about Arkansas is that it's a majority white state. It always has been. But the Delta is black and because of the plantations. And so it isn't that there are all kinds of ways in which people put up roadblocks to segregation and to dealing with, you know, all of these things. And it's still are putting up roadblocks to this day. But... The irony of all of this, of course, is that all of the black people pretty much saved the town from complete a decimation. It's it, there's about thirteen, fourteen thousand people there now. Uh, when I was there, it's about ten. You know, it's still the poorest part of the state, or maybe not the poorest part, but pretty poor. I mean, I've been to Bentonville, which is pretty rich. So <laughs> I know the difference. You know, it's like ah, but it's because I was able to wander. I was able to find in words. I was able to, you know, I had great, te- I mean, one of the other things about growing up in the South in the 50s and 60s is that there were all these women who taught and they were great teachers. You know, black or white, they were great teachers because they couldn't get other kinds of jobs. So they became really, really good at the profession they were in. I mean, I tell, I tell people to this day, why do why can I read Milton? Because in my senior year, in basically the last few weeks of senior, when everybody is already clocked out, right? Our English teacher and the practice teacher came in and had an argument about Milton. They sat in front of wow. yeah, talking about Legro and Il Penseroso. And it was hilarious. And we were like, what? What? You know. And to this day, I can I can tell people, you know, who said trip to light fantastic first? Milton. You know, it was that. So that's what I'm talking about. We had that kind of that level of engagement on the part of the of the teachers, 
And if you were somebody who, like me, loved to read and write, they loved you. So I, I, I do not, you know, I, I disparage what is taking place in public schools because a lot of it, uh, a lot of it has to do with disparaging teachers. Yeah, it's it's pretty devastating to watch the evisceration of public schools. Yeah, of course. It's a mess. Let's talk poetry. So you brought in Lorenzo Thomas's poem, The Bathers. Do you want to just go ahead and read it and then we'll launch into talking about it? Yeah. And it's a bit of a long poem, so people, you know, be patient. We turn to fire when the water hit. Us something berserk regained, an outmoded regard for sanity, while in the fire station no one thought of flame, fame or fortune did them. We did them a fortune. We did them a favor just being ourselves inside of them, holy dang children. In the nation coming, your children will learn all about that. But the water creep about us. Water hit us with force. We saw a boy transformed into a lion. His tail involved the syllable of love. A master before fellow craft. The summit of the royal arch. Lotus, mover on the face of the waters. Sleepless Horus, watch me as I lie. Curtained with stars when ye arise and part the skies and melt the royal bark. They said the ancient words in shameful English. Their hearts rose up like feathers in the hidden place. And Horus stepped into the flood of noon, shedding his light upon the worlds. It was in Birmingham. It happened. Week after week in the papers, their proof appeared in their faces. Week after week, seeing the same moment grow clearer, raising the water, filling the vessel, raising the water, filling the vessel. Oh, electromatic light shot doof. Ancient hands bearing water. Ha, ah, the star broke over the tub. All righteousness, not deceived by sunshine, nor the light from a man's desire, deceived by desire, so that in the moment the people cast light from their bodies. Light, in quotes, being the white premeditation, the simplest fashion. What they want is light. Another source to equip their dry want want firelight, space light, discretion is the neon, at least so to appear natural where the sun is, 360 degrees of light. Consumed on the in the labors of comfort, that cries for the balm of all of that is natural desire. Bathing in the dark, the water glowing in the plastic curtain, suddenly heated, as another expels past satisfactions, cold as she washes gas tears from her man's eyes. We hate you. Hot on her soft thigh, like the dog's breath at noon by the courthouse. We hate you for that. By ancient hands raised, This water, as the street preachers have a good understanding, hear them. O Israel this, O Israel that, down here in this place, cry for common privilege in a comfortable land. Their anger is drawing the water. Their daughter is drawing the water. Their kindness is laving and oiling its patience. That day, the figures on the trucks inspired no one. Some threw the water on their heads. They were Baptist. And that day, Horace bathed 
him in the water again. And Orisha walked amid the waters with hatchets, where Allah's useful white men came there hearing the water and made our street Jordan, and we stepped into our new land. Praise God, as it been since the first time through the tear of a mother. Wow. This is a, an amazing poem. The scale of it is so broad in terms of moving from Birmingham to Egypt, to the mythology of Egypt, to the violence of the civil rights movement. Do you want to take a crack at sort of summarizing it, or should we just talk about the poem other ways? Yeah, let's talk about but Let me read what I wrote a thousand years ago, back in 2006, literally. literally when I did the t- Making Your Words talk for About Lorenzo Thomas, War Poets House, I wrote about the bathers, and this is what I remember saying, because, you know, I was being very eloquent uh, at that point. And because it, 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 it was a book, but anyway, the poem, The Bathers, and I said this, given we just talked about being Southerners. As a Southerner who grew up in America in the King years, as Taylor Branch puts it, the title poem offers readers a deeper and different way to consider the courage, power, and sacrifice of the black children of Birmingham in the civil rights struggle. The poem is an epic that chronicles the children's campaign in which the good sheriff of Birmingham sent German shepherds, police in riot gear, and firehouse hoses to fight the well-dressed, peaceful children marching for freedom and equality. Holy Day children, Thomas calls them. Baptized not only in the horrific waters from the Birmingham fire hydrants, but also elevated in a deeper ancient knowledge, an African spirituality, if you will. Horace, the sky god, is seen as protector of these children and their memory. And that's, you know, and I think about it because the idea of Horus is the Egyptian god that he uses, not Osiris, not Isis, but Horus, right? And then, I mean, what I couldn't do, uh, I couldn't read because I couldn't even quite figure them all out, were the uh, hieroglyphics. And if you know anybody in the Egyptian department, they can tell you what they are. I mean, I looked up some of them. I did find the lion, obviously, and I found the Aleph and one other thing, but that was it. I couldn't figure the other ones out at all. I mean, I know what they look like and I have a bit, but I couldn't match them to whatever I was looking at and Google. Yeah. For context, for listeners who I'll have a link to where you can see the poem in the show notes. On the first page after the line, mover on the face of the waters, there's a series of hieroglyphs, which I very foolishly thought I might be able to find the what this means. <laughs> well, I think I think that it's because I think they were either drawn by Lorenzo or drawn by his brother, Cecil, um, who was an artist. So that might be it. So let's yeah, let's talk about the poem. Where did you had you never read the bathers or? No, I had never read anything by Lorenzo Thomas. He had not been on my radar. Oh, no. <gasps> oh my I God. I know. And so I found the collected poems. You had sent me a PDF with part of the bathers. And one of the things that the anthologists write about is he doesn't get enough attention, that he's been forgotten by a lot of people, that writers like Harriet Mullen, who write in a similar vein, have kept more fame or more attention and he's he's astonishing. Lorenzo is like you know because he's from New York and, and, and in some ways he's 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 that guy uh, who straddles the Black Arts Movement and the New York School. And and then he left the city and he moved a lot around a lot uh, and he wound up in Texas and Houston where he taught for many years and not in the creative writing program because well you know. The Korean writing program of those times was all white. And but he he used that platform to then go pretty much around the world. He went to conferences all over the planet. 
but he taught a lot and he didn't publish a great deal. He published basically three major collections while he was alive and several chapbooks. I am grateful that the collective poem got published because it took many years for that to happen. But um, believe me, he, there's a whole coterie of us who love Lorenzo's work, but he's not taught. Well, his poems are astonishing because there's this connection to the Black arts movements. They also read at times like New York School poems. So there's a strangeness to them that I, I wonder if might be off-putting for a lot of readers, but I find that actually really engaging. I don't think it's off-putting. I think it's that, as I said earlier in the earlier part of the my little talk, was that to me, Lorenzo was the different voice. He was a, he he his voice was clearly very black, but it wasn't like everybody else. I mean, the man was deep into Egyptology. He knew all about it. I mean, and at the end, when he's like mixing all the, the Orishas, who are you know that's West African, Egypt, and then then Allah, he's like dealing with this whole part of the world and its influence, cultural and spiritual, on the Americas, right? In this poem, I mean, he just but he doesn't say, oh, "I am now dealing with all these things." At this point, he doesn't do that. There's a real kind of sense of, I am going to elevate these children. This is how I'm going to do it. There are amazing poems about what happened in Birmingham. Dudley Rand, all these people, they all wrote amazing poems. But to me, this was like the best one because of that spiritual connection, that there is actually a demand on the part of the reader to consider that what was going on there was something that literally was almost like in a Yeatsian term, something that had literally had to happen in order for humanity to move forward in some way. I mean, because this was all about purgation also, when you think about it. I mean, the, you know, that's what baptism is, right? It's like purging you. But the, there are two key things that he says here. He said, we did them a favor. So he's talking about all these white people, right? You know, we made them stand up and show themselves. And a considerable number of them realized they didn't like what they saw. And another considerable number of them were perfectly happy. A bold Connor was perfectly happy to be a racist creep. And that comes back and is echoed uh, later when he goes, as the street preachers have a good understanding, hear them, oh, Israel this, oh, Israel that, down here in this place, crying for common privilege in a comfortable land, which is almost Baldwin-esque, right? That's basically what Baldwin was saying over and over again in his prose. Look at us. We're dealing with the fact that y'all have all this stuff and you don't want us to share it? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, old white people. And so, so, <laughs> so that's part of it. But also, I mean, it's just, he was a master of his craft. I mean, the stanzas in these, this poem are amazing. And they all fit. I mean, there are three-line stanzas, four-line stanzas, uh, several uh, couplets, there's one great um, mono set, the old, the one old electromatic light shaduf, which is amazing to me. The enjambments are amazing. And then all of a sudden he'll say stuff that, you know, and then you realize what he's saying as another expels past satisfactions cold as she washes gas tears from a man's eyes. I mean, good grief. And that comes like, way deep into the poem, right? He doesn't come at the beginning. He doesn't give you what you expect to have. He makes you find that. And and because of that, because of that kind of deeper walk in into the forest of, of violence, because of that, it feels even more horrifying to me. And that's, I think, something he accomplishes with the scale of the poem in, in, in moving across 
these different kind of languages in or or, or frames of language. Like the opening stanza is fairly abstract, but then we get these the the lines you just read: "Cold as she washes tear gas tears from her man's eyes, we hate you." I mean, that's absolutely incredible. And like you said, the way it moves from sort of one mode of expression to another that we get, I think, just the one in the nation coming, your children will learn all about that. And like you say, with the the line breaks toward the end, but ancient hands raised this water. There's that, that break before this water, which takes us into the realm of sort of the bathers, the violence of the hoses. The phrase that coming is coming to my head is all over the place, but not in a critical way, in a very positive way, that he manages to bring together this sort of cluster of histories and mythologies around these events. One of the problems I think that a lot of poets have, and, you know, because, you know, unless you write prose poems or something, is the totality of experience. And that's what he's talking about. It's like, it's not just one little thing it's all of this and and because that's how it was dealt with i mean if you were a black child in that movement and you were you and you faced those hopes so there were several things there were the people who were turning the hoses on you they were they were they came out of the firehouse and uh while in the fire station no one thought of playing because they were going to bring out the hoses, right, to hose down children, not actual fires. So that's one side of it. And then there, there's children, they're coming out, and they want change. They want something better. And they're willing to sacrifice their own bodies to do that. You know, and it's the difference from being a victim of lynching, right, to say, I will stand in front of you, MFs, and make you look like the horrible human beings that you are because I refuse to be treated like this again. That's how serious it was. And I think people forget just how, I mean, we talk about the civil rights martyrs, but civil rights actions took place all across the South in all manner of ways, and they all had to do with disrupting and erupting and removing the status quo in one way or another. They could be peaceful, they could be violent. All of those things happen. The response, white resistance, white resistance up until like maybe 1968 was vile, vile, and vile. Period. The Birmingham Children's Campaign is kind of like a crystalline version of all of that. All salutations to those children and their parents and grandparents and cousins and whatever who were right behind them. And there was a great many arguments around them doing Those children said, you know, we're going to do it. And so it's, a, it's really important to think about the capacity of people to be able to write about experiences in totality, to take the time to make the effort uh, out of whatever, you know, on whatever topic they're dealing with, and, and to be willing to not be so quickly understood. I mean, I think that that's what Lorenzo is saying as a poet. He's saying, take it all in and then dissect it and bring it back out. What will you find? How will it be transformed? This was Lorenzo after he came back from Vietnam. Uh, this is Lorenzo who had, he had experienced a great many things, including early acclaim. But he, you know, because he was part of the Umbra group, he was hearing a different voice. He was trying to bring a different voice, a different way of looking at things, a different way of, you know, and I think he was looking at mysticism in a very deep and important way. And because of that, I mean, I think that's why the Egyptian stuff is so, you know, Egyptology was so important. And there are a number of black poets who are deep into Egyptology 
And so, I, you know, because I, I think he was trying to find another way of talking about what it's like to be of African descent that wasn't the usual way of doing it. Well, it's also the poem is in that way about community, that it's looking at a historical community as well as the we of the Birmingham children's, of of the children protesting. So that's one of the things that moves me so much about the poem is the way in which it creates these different communities and historical continuities and distills to, I think, what is my new favorite line or favorite last line in a poem, as it has been since the first time through the tear of a mother. And, and just recontextualizing everything to that love of the mother, the care of the mother, because everything has been seen from a kind of larger scale. And then we come down to this single moment, the single person, the single tear. Thank you so much for bringing him to my attention. I'm so glad. It's sort of wonderful. And, 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 the, and the other thing that's like amazing to me about Lorenzo is that, you know, this is, that was one of his really long poems, but probably one of my favorite poems of his is like about eight or nine lines, <laughs> which, is, which is very funny. And I, I'm going to read it because it's really funny. It's called Sugar Hill. And as you know, Sugar Hill was the name of the uh, the celebrated block in Harlem where all the black elite wanted to live. And if you've ever been to Harlem and you walked on that street, you know, we walked up there, you know how beautiful those those buildings are and stuff like that. Sugar Hill. How you like that, quadrasonic baby? When you turn these speakers up behind this music, a breeze actually blows through the room. Man, that's how come I believe engineers truly exist, though we cannot see them. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's a great last line. Oh, I think that's hilarious. I mean, I mean, so he could do both, right? He could do it all. I mean, it's like he had this sense of humor. And also, do you ever see engineers? Heck no. So- <laughs> Well, I teach a lot of engineering students, so I, I see future engineers. They will appreciate that point. It's because it's just because it's like somebody makes the structure. Somebody makes it happen. I mean, I remember going to a Who concert and seeing or a P Funk concert and seeing these wall of speakers, right? And somebody made those speakers. They're engineers. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, while, while we're sharing other poems, do you want to transition and share a poem from the beloved community? So I was thinking about one that kind of responds about community and is also, well, it's a lot more direct probably than Lorenzo's, but I lived in Atlanta for a while, so I had some sense of when the Atlanta child murders were taking place of the landscape that they were killed in. I'm still horrified by what happened. Here goes. Uh, This is from the beloved community. Green Ribbons. I hardly ever read this poem, so this is big. Oh, thank you. Green ribbons flutter and reside on lapels of women and some men. Green ribbons for the dark-skinned, skinny, chubby, light-complected boys and girls. Green ribbons for their safe return, intact, smiling, scowling, howling, cursing, happy. Oh, those dreams of happy endings. Everyone dreams of happy endings. But Atlanta is where endings are ambiguous. Tomorrow, another day, endings. Find the bloodied leg, the missing digits, the raped vagina, the cut-off ear, the eyes left open for the birds, or gently shut to mark tears. See no more, see no more. Desperate are the mothers searching the wind for the sound of sneakers. Desperate are the mothers who have not received that phone call. Desperate are the mothers who gave their children money to pick up milk 
at the corner store. The cameras frame a tired woman's tired face, a tired man's tired face, the abundantly furnished living room cluttered but clean. The microphones are prose into the innermost sadness of parents bereft. The mayor intones emergency. Police beat bushes, beat up the older children, beat the time spent not worrying about dark-skinned, skinny, chubby, light-complexioned children, beat themselves. Why can't we catch this monster? The kudzu, an immortal, wraps the light poles and fences and drowns the air with thick green madness. All summer long, the children walk into the green darkness and return as ghosts. Ghosts scorch the green fields where they met the blasted heat of hatred. Promise ended tomorrow is someone else's day. Waving a kind of greeting to the newly lost. These ribbons impel a terrible scheming each time they are pinned to dresses, blouses, suit coats, jean jackets, green, green ribbons for the skinny, chubby, dark skinned, light complected boys and girls caught in the deep verdure of the city primeval. Thus, these ghosts stalk the corner store and basketball courts, the holiness church where the minister sweats a flood of salvation. They walk the halls outside the boys' and girls' lavatories. They watch over the babies and shake their heads when a mother smokes a pipe with no tobacco and a father is victim of a drive-by. They scorch the green fields with their ashy limbs. Running fast, they scour the distant wires, loving the chatter of blackbirds. They sing sometimes, but only their parents can hear them. When they do, they take red clay and graves. Oh, wow. That is intense. That's wonderful. The Atlanta child murders were so devastating. And something that I think you capture so beautifully is the strength of the mothers who were working to bring this to the attention of the police and the city when they didn't want to give it attention. And the extent to which everything dragged on and on and on. That that sense to which these women are incredibly powerful in the way that they band together, and yet the city is punishing them by ignoring them, and, and the, the way the green ribbon becomes this symbol eventually, yet there's this helplessness as, as it goes on for so long. That's, that's, that's a fantastic poem. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a reason why I don't, I read, <laughs> I don't read it very often, because it's very hard to read, and it really is. It's intense. I mean, I just think about all those children becoming ghosts. They're haunting, they haunt the city. They will haunt the city forever. I read it before, it, yeah, because it, it, you know, I mean, I can feel the influence of, of, of Lorenzo on that poem as well. In terms of taking on the totality of something and trying to figure out uh, how to how to explore it as a poem and not as a piece of prose, although People who have taken this on, I mean, I still to this day think that Tony Cave and Barra got sick because she wrote a novel behind all this because it was so horrible. I also realized when I was reading it yesterday and some of it, and, you know, I, as I said to you, I, I went to an Episcopal mission school, so there's, there's there are these sort of liturgical inflections, you know, in the poem, you know, desperate are, desperate are, desperate are. Any you know, of the ways in which uh, the liturgy, the use of repetition to kind of call on, call on, call on, you know, the spirits, the larger, you know, the cosmos, help, help, help. The Green Rivers, that was the first time I thought I saw a lot of white people wearing those ribbons. 
and taking on some of the responsibility for the kind of things that were happening. You know, besides, you know, that that all, all suddenly the all these children that have been neglected, ignored um, by society, were talked about the the vulnerability of black children, and it goes back to the vulnerability of black children, and and the bathers. Well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. The 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 tonal shift here now that we move to the silliness part of the podcast is just not going to work. Today, as always, we have an ad. It's so difficult for college literature professors when there's not a single shared text that all your students know. Back in the good old days, you could rely on all of your students having read The Great Gatsby and Romeo and Juliet, but now it's impossible to know what your students have read. Well, lit profs, someone is finally thinking of you. (laughs) The Florida Department of Education has stepped in. All of that noise about supposed book bans, that's not true at all. No, we've invited our well-read populace to help in what we call curricular carving. They help us help college literature professors by narrowing down reading lists to a few shared texts. So when students get to college, instructors know just what they've read. (laughs) When our students step into your classroom, you can rely on them having read Genesis, Leviticus, John 316, a pamphlet produced by the John Birch Society, and Ronald Reagan's abridged version of the United States Constitution for Dummies. That's the Florida Department of Education. You know our motto, hush now, you hear? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good, good. You enjoyed that. (laughs) Oh, so The other thing you can call hush now becomes stupid. (laughs) All right. (laughs) We are playing a game that I'm calling Patricia Spears Jones, This Is Not Your Life. I'm going to give you a fact, and you have to tell me if it's about Patti LaBelle, born Patricia Louise Holt, Britney Spears, or Quincy Jones. It may be a fact about their life or the title of a song or album they were part of somehow. There will be six questions. Patricia Spears Jones, are you ready to play Patricia Spears Jones, This Is Not Your Life? Oh, hell no, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, number one. This person's middle name is Delight. Who are the people I'm supposed to be talking about? Uh, Patti LaBelle, Britney Spears, and Quincy Jones. I would assume it's Britney Spears. Actually, her middle name is Jean. Quincy Jones' middle name is Delight. No. Yeah. I, I was kind of blown away. I love that. His mama was on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> he claims, by the way, that Ray Charles introduced him to heroin. I believe that. Number two, this person was once sued for yelling at someone and spilling water on their baby in the Trump Place apartments in Manhattan. Was it Patti LaBelle, Britney Spears, or Quincy Jones? I think that was Britney. That was Patti LaBelle. No. Okay. Yeah, she settled out of court for $100,000 and the family donated it to charity because they realized how ridiculous it was. Number three, this person has been married three times. Brittany? Yes. In fact, it's a trick question or the question with two answers. Quincy Jones was also married three times. Yeah, okay. I was like, because I knew Patty LaBelle and I'm just married. Okay. Okay. Number four, there's just three more. This person has an album titled Tasty. Tasty? Yeah, Tasty. This sounds like a Quincy Jones album, but I I have no idea. I was shocked to learn it is Patti LaBelle. Ew, okay. Mm-hmm. I, it seems like an outlier in her catalog. <laughs> terrible. Okay, go ahead. It's a, these are terrible questions. This person is responsible for the song Email My Heart. See? There's a song called Email My Heart, and this person is responsible. Is it Patti LaBelle, Britney Spears, Quincy Jones? I have no idea. That is Britney Spears. Okay, because I had never heard it. So, okay. The last one, blessedly for both of us. Thank you. <laughs> this person is responsible for an album titled Body Heat, which is actually really good. Body Heat? Wait, eh? I don't think it's Patti LaBelle. No. No, so it might be either Britney or Quincy. 
And... Well, remember, I did say it's actually really good. <laughs> so it must be Quincy. It is Quincy Jones. Okay, thank God. I'm I'm still getting over the the delight as a middle name for anybody. I'm sorry, but it just seems so out. You know, I knew it wasn't Patty, so that was good. So thank God. Anyway, yeah, don't I'm terrible at games things. So this was just now I'm totally embarrassed, and that's okay. <laughs> so. The games, when I originally came up with the podcast, were actually going to be kind of like poetry trivia. Oh, no. And the more I've done it, the sillier the games have gotten. And they are not at all a measure of one's intelligence or knowledge. <laughs> oh, no, this is dad. No, I'm just terrible at, you know, I can't play chess. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm awful at chess. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. I'm glad I was able to introduce you to Lorenzo Thomas. And thus to a whole lot of other people. Yes, thank you so much. The collected poems, y'all. Get the collected poems. Yes, it is out from uh, Wesleyan University Press, I believe. Yeah. And Extraordinary Measures is a great book of criticism. I was reading the introduction this morning. It's really, really smart. Yeah, it is. Really good. For listeners, as always, thanks for listening. Go have a great day. Read some poems. Pet some dogs. And support striking workers wherever you find them. <laughs> Bye. And buy my book. <laughs> yes. <laughs>